All right, good morning. We would turn to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be reading from verses 27 through 32. And be reminded as you turn there that this is God's holy word. Every single word of it is inspired by God, the Holy Spirit. It is inerrant. That means it has no errors at all. And it is fully sufficient for all of our revelation for salvation and godliness. So be addressed by God as you hear these words of Jesus in Matthew 5, starting in verse 27. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and its clarity. And even when it cuts us to the heart, in examining our sin to the very root, to all that you demand in your commandments, as we saw of life last week, and murder, and the hatred that boils up in our heart that would lash out to that extreme, if not for your grace. And so in the same way we see here about adultery, that another fire of lust, that your grace restrains sin, and yet everything in our sinful nature and everything in this world justifies it, tears us away from your law, the goodness of your commandment and your design. Lord, help us above all through your law to love the God who designed it, that we would love your design for us, that we would see the goodness and the wisdom in it, and we would see the danger of not adhering to these words of life. Lord, bring conviction where that needs to be the case, and above all, exalt the glory of your Son as the one who takes our sins upon himself. But Lord, let it be that we would not take that grace For granted, write this word upon our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, just as last week was called murderous heart, so this week is called adulterous heart. Jesus is doing the same thing here in this passage as the one we saw last week with murder. Same contrasting language. Look at verses 27 and 28, you'll see the repetition of, you have heard that it was said, But I say to you, and as we saw last week, the contrast there is not a conflict between Jesus and Moses, not a conflict between new and old, not between the new words of Jesus and the old words of the law. Rather, what's happening in these contrasting words that happen six times throughout this section is that the knob is being turned in on the microscope and the lens is zooming in from the surface of the commandment, in this case, adultery, the seventh commandment, the surface to the heart, not to leave behind the surface as we'll see, that would destroy the whole point, but to zoom in or to, in other words, to show us the x-rays, to do some preventative medicine, that we would do some operation to root out the sin, to hate the sin in our hearts. 
And of course, that seventh commandment in Exodus 20, verse 14, and it's repeated in Deuteronomy 5, 18, you shall not commit adultery. Now, in, again, both the commandments we looked at, what's the principle here? Well, it's what the prophet Samuel said to the house of Jesse about his sons. That same truth is true about the commandments, that man looks at the outward appearance of things, but God looks at the heart. That's not just some good news for us or some thing for us to, uh, to say about our calling in life or whatever it is, our sense of self-worth. That same truth is true about the evil in our hearts and the commandments that, that press in on us and that expose our sin. Jesus is not leaving behind the sin, as we'll see out there, but He is driving into what God sees, and He wants us to see what God sees. And so here's the big idea. There is a fire of lust in the heart that would violate all other commandments to commit adultery. As we see, we see with the commandment to murder, uh, we'll see here that James 2.10 principle is there, that if you violate one law, one commandment, you're guilty of the whole. And that means a lot of things. But one of the things it means is that when you break a commandment of God, you really have to break a bunch of other commandments to do it. You see that in obvious ways, that when we violate some commandment of God, we're always violating the first commandment. We're not loving the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have other gods before Him when we do that. Well, what we're going to see here is that this fire of lust is coveting. It is murdering. And it's doing a bunch of other things like that. We'll see that in three ways today. We'll see first, adultery in the heart. Second, adultery in the crosshairs, or x-rays, whatever metaphor you like. The whole idea there is, what is the nature of it in the heart? And then thirdly, we'll pick up that second section that really goes with this, and that is adultery in divorce and remarriage. So that's what we're driving at today. We'll, we'll zoom into the heart, and then we'll make that application that Jesus is making. Let's first look at this principle. And I think we're in a better position to understand what Jesus is doing here with the seventh commandment after having seen him do just the same thing with the sixth. And we'll, requ- we'll uh, recall that in all of the commandments, there's a do and a do not. There's a positive requirement and a negative re- uh, a prohibition, and they're related. You know, if I'm, if I'm hating on someone, it's because I haven't loved them. It's because I haven't cultivated love in my heart. And that's why I'm doing that. And it's the same thing in all the commandments. It's not just that there's a do and a don't. The do and our failure to do and to be what God requires as an image bearer is really the explanation for why that fire is leaping out of its cage and wreaking all this havoc on the world and creating all these problems. So what does Jesus say about the negative here? Well, he says in verse 28 that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, the commentators will point out here that lustful intent is really driving at something very specific. In other words, it is contemplating the steps to adultery in one's imagination. Some of those same commentators are quick to point out, because they have to, they're writing commentaries, they have more time than I have in 40 minutes or whatever, but it is worth saying, because sometimes people will say, so are you saying that looking, or that, um, or that appreciating beauty, or something like that, or toward one's own spouse, are we going to return to an evil, evil, an early medieval uh, view of sexuality? And and the answer is no, and the commentators are right to point that out. He is specifically addressing intent. In your mind, plotting maybe is a good word for it, even in in your own imaginations. But you can't even say to that, well, I wasn't plotting, I was just thinking, thinking what? Thinking it through. And so this has all sorts of ramifications here. So I almost want to caution those commentators and say, well, don't press that too far and give people the idea that Jesus is not also addressing the eye and addressing the heart, because that's exactly what he's doing here. The imagery that follows that about the eye causing offense, it really demands that this goes all the way down to the root of such thoughts. So think of where Job, in Job 31, 1 says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. 
How then could I gaze at a virgin? And, and their gaze means this idea of wandering in one's affections and one's attitudes. And men do that differently than women do. Different cultures do that than, than other cultures do. And so there's the, you know, the lawyer in all of us is going to jump up here and, and start to make exceptions for our own culture or our own way of doing that to say that, well, I'm not doing that. Um, and that's exactly what he's driving at here is this intent. Or in other words, the Tenth Commandment, coveting is really what's going on here just in this particular realm. And as I indicated last week, there's a misapplication of Jesus' words in this whole section that reasons in this way. You can look at this and say, okay, driving to the heart. This sin, namely lust in this case, it was hatred or anger last week, this sin is the same sin in the heart as it is out in the external act. You're already guilty of it, right? Adultery in this case. So what's happening there is that the person is not able to make the distinction between the essence of the sin in the heart, it is of the same essence, versus the evil of the extent of it. So a wrong way to reason last week was, okay, Jesus is saying that if I hate my brother, if I'm angry with my brother and hold on to that, then I have the same sin that Hitler had in murdering all those people. Yes, you have the same nature of that sin, but you do not have the same extent of that sin. And that's actually crucially important in a lot of ways because there's legalistic ways to apply this and to miss the whole point. It's the same thing here. So, for example, on a number of occasions in pastoral ministry, and, and I mean on a number of occasions, this has come up to me. Where somebody has asked me, and I think with total sincerity, and misapplying this very passage, would a spouse be justified in seeking divorce because of a spouse that has viewed pornography? Now, that's a legitimate question if you come away from this passage and you have that confusion. I say sincerely because they're not asking hypothetically. It's not a philosophical experiment. They're asking about a particular person or they're asking about themselves in their own case. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're, they're following Jesus' logic, but they're missing the point. The whole point is Jesus is saying, operate on that. I want you to hate that sin. Don't fly to the other extreme. I want you to use that as an opportunity to beat people over the head with so that they can't address their own sin. So you can't tell just from these words alone whether the person is trying to repent of their sin and deal with it versus if they just got caught. And so we have to make that distinction. Jesus is bringing this up so that we can locate that, quarantine that sin, and keeping it from getting out of its cage. If there were no degrees of sin, if there were no such thing as a distinction between the lustful thought, which is bad, and he wants to show us, You have not obeyed the seventh commandment. If you've said, well, I've I've avoided this and I've avoided that, you have the same sin, you have the same guilt before God. That's true. But if I said that there's no distinction between the thought versus acting out on it, well, then one of the problems that emerges from that, one of the absurdities, is that there would be no virtue at all in stopping it. There would be no virtue at all in repenting or confessing or trying to stop it or help somebody else to stop it. And so that's obviously not the takeaway from this passage. But such people, when they bring that up, they have this text in mind. It would defeat the whole point of Jesus bringing this up. Now, R.C. Sproul in his commentary strikes the balance here by saying, quote, Jesus is not saying that it is just as evil to lust as it is to commit adultery. But he is saying... That's one extreme, no distinction between the degrees. But he is saying that even if you have refrained from actual adultery, you haven't necessarily fulfilled the full dimension of the law. So Jesus is driving down there. So one thing I don't have in my notes, but I bring this up when people are asking me, you know, in premarital counseling, 
whether it's with somebody they're already with and they're looking toward marriage, or whether they're asking, you know, can I date unbelievers? Can I date a Roman Catholic? Can I date the... Can I? In other words, they're just, they're not taking things seriously. And I want to show this to them. And one of the things they struggle with is how far is too far and so forth beforehand. And in other words, can you commit adultery in the way Jesus is talking about before you're even married? And you say, well, of course not, because he's talking about married women. Indeed. However, is that woman, talking to a young man right now, hypothetically, is that young woman going to be your wife? And do you know that infallibly? I don't know that infallibly. Well, why would you ask such a question? Okay, well, that's somebody's wife, and you just said it wasn't. What are you talking about? Is she going to be your wife? Well, I don't know. We just established that. Well, if you don't know that, then you're messing with somebody else's wife. Or she is going to be your wife, and you don't love her enough to follow this through and make sure. And so, in, according to... Jesus' standard, the standard of perfection, this requires that, as Hebrews 13 says, that the marriage bed is kept undefiled, that you love each other, and by the way, love yourself and have enough self-respect to care for that person's total trajectory in the totality of their life, their body and their soul, and that of their spouse and children, and everything else it affects. It affects all that? Yes, it does. And so we have not obeyed the seventh commandment until we've gone to that extreme to guard each other's hearts and our own. And that brings us to the second point, that preventative medicine that we saw with murder, adultery in the crosshairs or adultery in the x-ray. And the words used in verse 29 and 30 for cause to stumble in the Greek, you know, in the, in the English it draws that out, cause to stumble. There's a word in the Greek, scandalize. And uh, you can recognize the sound of that word from which we get the English scandal or scandalized. And as one commentator points out, it's almost always used metaphorically in the New Testament. In fact, one place it's used is about the cross, that the cross is a scandal or a stumbling block. So stumbling block in that sense is causing someone to sin. And in this sense, it's used in this way, and in Romans 14, it's used that way as well. But here, you're causing somebody to sin in a a serious way that has major consequences for their soul and for yours, for your faith, and so forth. A scandal. But it does reinforce the idea that the fire of lust is being quarantined. In other words, this sin is a scandal or a stumbling block so that if you're thinking about this, it's something that will cause a scandal. Now, in the, in the normal sense of the word that we often mean it, something that could cause a serious problem out there. And so just as with murder, so with adultery, there's a fire in the heart, and it seeks to get out. This lust, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, he likens to a fire where he says that it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, that's not Paul's total doctrine of marriage. You've got to go to Ephesians 5 and some other places for that. But at least one good reason to be married is to be realistic and restrain your passions. So, don't reduce marriage to that, but don't throw that out. Paul there was dealing with being as he is, having that under control and so forth. But he is saying that it is a fire. And when Paul does that, he is standing in the tradition of the Proverbs. And I could read you many Proverbs that speak like this, but just one, Proverbs 6, 27 and 28, where there's these warnings given to the young man about the adulteress. And one way that it says it is this, can a man carry fire next to his chest and his clothes not be burned? Or can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be scorched? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. None who touches her will go unpunished. Now, in that context, it goes on to talk about how she will be avenged. And that's true, but the Proverbs are complete here. It goes beyond earthly punishments, just like we looked at last week about the earthly council. It ends out in hellfire. And this fire, when it goes to that extent 
will lead to a life that will wreck the souls of others and your own so that you'll start self-justifying. You'll start exploring other lifestyles. You'll need a harder drug. It's just like anything else. And so is that connected to salvation? Is that connected to hell? You bet it is. And Jesus is saying that this fire on the inside will take you further than you ever thought. Now, there's a word about the parallel words here in verse 29 and 30. And and he does it twice with the eye and the hand. He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Then he says in verse 30, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. And, and, and I'm not, certainly not belittling anyone who has this question. It, it, I suppose it could be a natural question. I've gotten it. Um, you know, people have, sometimes it'll be skeptics mocking the faith and they'll, they'll bring it up that way. But sometimes it'll be people just honestly asking, is Jesus? Uh, so let me answer it uh, for you. He's not advocating self-mutilation. Um, this is what we would call hyperbole. This is exaggerated speech, and if you're wondering, exaggerated speech does not mean lying speech. It means in inflating one piece of imagery to talk about something that he's not exaggerating about at all. But in this case, he is using very violent language. And if you want another place that talks like in this way in the Bible, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4, just compare these statements to Hebrews 12, 4, and you'll get a sense of why someone would talk like this. And there the context is following in the example of Christ and then also discipline from our Father. But what he says is, in your struggle against sin, you've not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Now what's going on there? Well, the author of Hebrews was not suggesting that you could actually deal with sin by shedding your own blood. That's not the point. Only Christ's blood will help there. So what's he doing instead? Well, he's using spirit-inspired hyperbole, inflated or exaggerated speech to call us on our bluff. The author of Hebrews is, in effect, he's saying, so you're fighting against sin, are you? You're going to complain about God's discipline, are you? But have you fought against your sin to the point of shedding blood? To bloodshed? In other words, he's calling us on our bluff. He's commending this violent language, not, so, not as a remedy that that's actually going to deal with sin, but to use this, and he does this elsewhere, about killing your sin in Romans 8.13, about crucifying your sin in Galatians 5.24. And so there's this violent language to talk about our fight against sin. And so it is here in Matthew 5. Jesus is using targeted hyperbole, hyperbolic speech, exaggerated speech for effect. But I say it's targeted because when it comes to the consequences, when it comes to what's at stake, Jesus is not exaggerating at all. That part of the equation, that it is better that you would lose even your eye, that you would lose even your right hand, that you would lose anything in this life then that your body would be cast into hell. So what's the punchline? Your whole person is on the line. The exaggerated imagery is fixing on the extremes of a bodily fight. He isn't prescribing a remedy at all, but he is awakening the soul to the danger of hellfire and saying, in effect, wake up and fight. And this is incredibly, incredibly practical. And not just for pastors, but just for accountability. Brothers and sisters in Christ, but you see this especially with brothers in Christ. Fighting this. See, here's the point. Here's why the hyperbole works. There's a wide spectrum between the extreme, cut off your hand, gouge out your eyes, versus the nothing that you're probably doing. And that's what I mean by calling us on our bluff. There are many, many, many people who will say, I have this sin. What do I do? Answer, and it's just one of many answers you could give. Have you tried taking TV out of your house? 
Have you tried giving up internet? Have you tried getting rid of Netflix? Have you tried not visiting that place? Have you tried not talking to that person or talking about those things? Have you tried this? You can't even get past, have you tried getting through Netflix or or gotten rid of Netflix before the person says, that's legalistic. Oh, so you're coming to me for the, what, 35th time about this sin, but I'm a legalist because you won't get rid of Netflix. What's he doing? He's saying, your hand, your eye, he's creating that hyperbole to call us on our bluff. Because if heaven and hell is at stake, how much better is it? And by the way, how much easier is it to lose a relationship that's not a Christian relationship anyway? Or to lose internet access? Or to lose any other number of things that it would be far easier to sacrifice to get away from that fire? And so that's why Jesus would use language like this. And then there's that last section. And our third section, adultery in divorce and remarriage. So he's driven into the heart. He's shown us the x-ray. And now there's this application to one of the things that happens when we don't restrain this. And it's a terrible, terrible thing that has massive, massive fallout in this lifetime. Divorce. Now, first things first, because there's a context here. And the context is the same context as the rest of this section from verse 21 to 48. There's the six antitheses of Jesus. You have heard it said, I say to you. What do people do with this? And and a lot of what Jesus is doing here is attacking our liberalism. But he's also attacking legalism. Because of the rabbinical schools in the first century in the Jewish world, There were legalists and there were liberals. There were people that were finding loopholes and there were people that were closing those loopholes. And they were saying in effect to God, hey God, you missed a spot. I think you need my help to settle these liberals. So you had two different extreme ways to add to the law of God that Jesus was correcting the rabbinical tradition. And in this particular case, Matthew 19 gives us a little bit more context And the commandment that the Pharisees and Jesus are disputing over comes from Deuteronomy 24, and it's one verse you might want to turn to, is Deuteronomy 24, but of course you could turn to Matthew 19 as well, because that's where it really comes up. And what is being disputed is something called, sometimes called, the any cause clause. The any cause clause from Deuteronomy 24. In other words, getting divorced from your spouse any reason, which is not what Deuteronomy 24 says, but it was added. So in Matthew 19, and starting in verse 3, the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now stop right there. The word any can mean two very different things. Any could mean any, or any could mean any? You know, I could be looking for a loophole. And so that's what's going on here. Jesus answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery." So what we have to do, and when we do Matthew 19, Lord willing, there's too much to cover here. When we get to Matthew 19, we'll talk about the stringent stringent, um, interpretation of that to deal with the liberal interpretation. What we want to do right now in chapter 5, verse 32, is to deal with the conservative or the more legalistic interpretation and adding to God's Word. So just bear that in mind if I miss a bunch of stuff, because I will. There's just too much to carry, uh, to cover here. But the, here's what you need to know. The original text of Deuteronomy 24, what they're referring to, 
should not be any cause, in other words, any reason that happens to displease the man whatsoever, but rather the Hebrew word that's used there, erva, which can be rendered nakedness. You see that throughout the Pentateuch, where there's laws that are against uh, uncovering your brother's nakedness, uh, or his wife, or so on and so forth. In other words, indecency. In other words, the very word sexual immorality, which is porneia in the Greek here in Matthew 5, is what is in view. In other words, Jesus isn't actually saying anything different than Moses said. Moses said for sexual immorality. The Pharisees had decided, and this is the more liberal school, any cause, any reason, when all God was saying through Moses is, in the context of adultery, if the husband has any suspicion. And so they took any to be anything, literally burning the dinner. In the um, Mishnah in the first century, there are cases where this happened for a wife burning the dinner. I kid you not. And so Jesus is correcting that, that the Pharisees are bringing to him. This is about an indecency of a sexual nature. And the Jewish historian of the first century, Josephus, commented on this abuse of Deuteronomy 24.1 in the same way. He says, quote, He that desires to be divorced from his wife for any cause whatsoever, and many such causes happen among men, end quote. And so it was widely known in the Jewish world in the first century that Deuteronomy 24 was being abused by men to just throw their women out for any reason that displeased them. That's the context of this verse. Now, this is personal because when I uh, planted a church uh, years ago, the first controversy in that church in our little group was over um, John Piper had come out with a view um, which is not unique to him. There's, there's others who hold it, but they're in the overwhelming minority and for a good reason. The view is that pornea in the Greek in Matthew 5 actually just means the betrothal stage only and that there's actually no exception whatsoever for divorce and remarriage. And that became a, a big controversy in our group. And uh, so I had to write a position paper for it and make a study of it and so on and so forth. And I like Piper, but he's just wrong. And it's very admirable what he's trying to do. He sees our liberal culture. He sees no-fault divorce. He sees those things, and it's, uh, what do we do? We close the loopholes. But as much as we might want to push back against some cultural attack on God's Word or God's law, we don't want to form our doctrine in reaction. We want to make sure that we have the correct context of the Scriptures here. Okay, And so that's what's going on there. And as one commentator summarizes, the intention of the present gospel text is to challenge easy divorce and therefore labeling the subsequently formed relationship as adultery. And that's going to be crucial too, because you'll hear, but remarriage is totally forbidden there. It's, it's never mentioned uh, otherwise. And at first, again, that seems to make good sense to people. They'll say there's, there's nothing here permitting remarriage, only that the divorces in those particular instances are permissible. Well, on the contrary, Jesus would not have included the remarriage portion in the same context of this correction to their view of Deuteronomy 24 um, if it was not in the same context. And lo and behold, if you go back to Deuteronomy 24 and you move on to verses 2 and 4, it says, And if she goes and becomes another man's wife, And the latter man hates her, so this is the second man that she's been thrown to, and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Or if the latter man dies, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord. Now, how does that help us? with Jesus' words for our day. Well, note well the words of Jesus, that whoever does this to a woman makes her commit adultery. If you read this out of context without any of that other background, you're thinking, so a man does this, or let's say they both agree to it, the woman is the adulteress. And that's your first clue, the woman alone. That's obviously not how it reads and can't be what it means. But it doesn't mean that his act 
is her act. Now, one of the things that happened in the middle of that controversy years ago, and I was waiting for it, and sure enough, it came out, is that we had these, um, uh, we had a pretty small group, and a couple of uh, our starter group were um, four or five uh, divorcees, ladies. And in all their cases, they had been abused in various ways. Now, come on, Matt, can you prove that going back into their past? No, I can't. I can't prove it. But that was the basic idea. And what came out eventually, and guard your heart for this so that you don't turn into a monster, was she must have done something wrong. Well, unlike, unlike you, unlike me, people, we all do something wrong every second of the day. But that's a distinct matter from this particular sin. And so if you're not careful with these texts in their context, you can easily start correcting liberals who are finding loopholes with legalism that adds to God's law things that are not in God's law. Now, there's a very different world in the first century and back in the ancient world than our day. This was a provision in the law of Moses. This is what Jesus meant in Matthew 19. Because of your hardened hearts, Moses gives you this, permission, uh, this provision. Why? Because women were being abused. In the ancient world, they were commodities. This was actually a gracious provision of God to protect the status of those women. Now, another problem here is that if you say, well, X, Y, and Z is not in the text here in Matthew 5. Well, in addition to them being in other texts, there's another problem with that kind of reasoning. Let me just give you one. One other thing that's not in this text that I think would lead to absurdities if we said, well, then it's not true. For example, look carefully at the whole text from Matthew 5, 27 to 32. Notice that Jesus is addressing the man, the man's adultery, the man's lust in his eye. Well, there you have it. A woman can't be guilty of this sin. Well, you wouldn't say that, would you? That a woman can sin in this way as well. So you see, we have to use reasonable inferences and, and in general, not be obtuse when we're looking at texts like this. So it's a very, very, very critical thing to read this in the context of all the other scriptures that speak to it. Now, this text, this passage, and this truth is for our practical lives. In the first place, this is a warning. This is a warning not just to young men. This is a warning to everybody. I mentioned that spectrum of remedies. On the one extreme, you've got gouging out your eyes, tearing off your right hand. You have this exaggerated speech, this violent speech. But at the other end, you have doing nothing. So what do we have here? Well, have you resisted, as the author of Hebrews says, to the point of shedding your blood? In other words, have you even tried getting rid of the Netflix? Well, I'm not trying to pick on just Netflix here. I think you get the idea. They, it stands for anything, anything that is the occasion for this sin. Meet with a brother in the Lord. Pray with him. Speak to him about these things. Confess your sins in church. Confess them in the right context. There's appropriate and inappropriate, especially in dealing with this particular sin. But are you fighting against it? All Christians will sin. All Christians will wrestle against sin. But the key is, are you wrestling against it? Are you fighting against your sin? Because if you're not, you're not a Christian. You know, Luther, the first of his 95 Theses, you might be surprised. You think, oh, it's about indulgences. Maybe it's about justification. Maybe it's about Mary. His first thesis was that the Christian life is a life of repentance. In other words, a true Christian is always repenting. And one reason is we're always sinning. That doesn't mean you're getting resaved. No one loses their salvation, but we're always confessing our sins. We're always wrestling against our sin, hating our sin more and more, fighting against our sin more and more. And that's really the other application. Acts chapter 3, 19, repent therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. And so with both of the sins that we've spoken of in these two passages, whether it's anger in the heart or whether it's lust in the heart, 
There's nothing to do but repent. What's your alternative? To turn back. Thomas Watson, in his book on repentance, says, Repentance is a grace of God's Spirit, whereby a sinner is inwardly humbled and visibly reformed. Remember from Matthew 4, John the Baptist, bring fruits of repentance. It makes a difference in your life. You will change your surroundings. You can't tear your heart out. You have indwelling sin until the day you die. But you can and you should reform things, whatever it takes in your life. And then finally, there's gospel. You know, in the Bible, throughout Scripture, our idolatry is compared to adultery. You think of passages like Ezekiel 16, where God reminds Israel that I found you as a virgin, and I brought you in, I cleansed you, and then he paints this picture that you went out anyway. And you think of Hosea 1 through 3, where God's prophet Hosea was told to marry a harlot, and he did. And then she went back to a life of harlotry. And in chapter 3, you see this picture of the cross of Christ, where Hosea is told to go and purchase her. And she is to come and live in his house and not sin anymore. But what's the hope of this? Is it that we'll reform ourselves? Is that the hope that we've been transformed from adulteresses to something better? No, it is something Christ does. 2 Timothy 2.13 says that if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And let's remember from Isaiah 53.6 that all we like sheep have gone astray. There's no exception there. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In the grand scheme of things, we're all that adulterous. We all went out. We all worshipped other gods. We had other lords. We had other husbands. It's what the the word Lord and Baal mean in the Old Testament. There's another word for it is husbands. And he uses that imagery to show us that he is the only one that is finally faithful And he cleanses us from all of our sins. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that your son has paid the price. Your son has been the faithful one, the promise keeper, the one who is pure, the one who lays down his life for his bride, the church. Help us, Lord, to not take that grace for granted. Cause us by your Holy Spirit to desire to have that washing of the water with the word that that great picture of marriage in Ephesians 5 teaches us about. Wash us now by this word. Purify our hearts. Burn away this fire of lust as you do this fire of anger by the greater fire that your wrath was poured out on your son instead of on us. And let us respond by your spirit in gratitude and desire to do this for your glory, that we would be jealous for your name's sake to hate these sins within ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.